Welcome, everybody, to the session that tackles head-on the most fundamental question in publishing today, uh, the one that actually every conversation at uh, Digital Minds today and at London Book Fair over the coming week will probably come down to, who pays? Um, it used to be so easy, didn't it? You published a book, you went home, and you waited for people to buy it. And I'm old enough to remember the net book agreement. Remember those days? The argument was that books were special, you know, valued and precious, and they had to have special prices on them. So post-net book agreement, post-internet, now that every, uh, everybody wants information to be free, now that information wants itself to be free, uh, now that our attention spans have shrunk to nanoseconds, now that library budgets have been slashed, uh, now that consumers expect to be entertained and informed for free, who does pay? So luckily, I have four eminent and um, creative uh, peers in the industry to answer the question today. So I am very welcome, uh, big welcome to Francis Pinter from Knowledge Unbound, Ashley Gardner from Wattpad, Dan Kiernan from Unbound, and Jan Reichelt from Mendeley. If I could just ask you to introduce yourselves first, and then we'll go on to the, the questions. So should we start with you, Ashley? Sure, thank you. Um, so I'm Ashley Gardner and I'm Head of Content and Publishing at Wattpad. And Wattpad is a social platform for readers and writers to connect and share stories. It's a user-generated content platform so anyone can upload any content and share it with our user base. Uh, we're currently in more than 50 languages and we have over 20 million registered users. Uh, and I think that there's a few reasons on why Wattpad has grown so quickly where you know, some similar sites maybe haven't. And I just kind of wanted to quickly discuss a few of those in, to give you a sense of kind of who we are and, and what we're doing. So I think one of the first things that, that Wattpad did that really helped us grow so fast was that we really focused on, on readers first. And I think that made the site a lot more appealing for writers when there was this critical mass. And I think it's a common misconception that Wattpad is a site for writers because I think something that publishers should be aware of is that 90% of our user base is just reading. They're just coming to the site to discover new writers, to read, and to comment. And there's a lot of power in activating that user base. I think another big part is the, that we didn't focus on a particular niche or age group. And uh, about Wattpad, I think that we're commonly seen as a, as a teen site because we're so popular with teens. And about 50% of our user base is 13 to 18. But it's also extremely important to be aware that over 35% are 18 to 30, and we're continuing to grow into different demographics as we grow in size. And then I think the last thing is just that we haven't focused on aspiring writers only. I think there's a lot of sites out there that are for writers and for writing professionals. And I think that while that's also a big part of Wattpad, what makes it a lot easier for people to join is that the call to action is very simple. It's to share your story. And that allows anyone to join, anyone to start, whether they you know, don't have a manuscript written. People People can post simply a chapter and then begin to add to that. And it can be very daunting to write an entire book, but it's much easier to just post a chapter. And by posting that chapter, you can begin to receive feedback and continue to, to grow. And it can be very, uh, you know, it can really help encourage new writers. And, you know, on that point, we're not just a site for writers. I think that people, um, People that consider themselves, uh, don't consider themselves writers yet, are doing very well on Wattpad. I'd compare us to a lot of other sites like YouTube and like Instagram as well. You know, not everyone on Instagram wants to be a professional photographer, but a lot of people will find success there and go on to that. And I'd put Wattpad in a similar category. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Thanks. Ashley. Thanks. Francis. Thank you very much. Um, I thought I was being invited to talk about crowdsourcing and crowdfunding because Knowledge Unlatched. Um, knowledge unlatched, not un unlocked, un glued, unbound, knowledge unlatched, um, is basically a crowdfunding mechanism for sorting out a very specific problem. The problem is monographs. Please don't groan. This is not a boring part of, of publishing. It's actually very exciting in the scholarly world. These are long-form publications that have specialist peer-to-peer -peer appeal. The problem is prices are going up, print runs or digital runs are going down, and uh, there's such pressure on library budgets that are the main purchasers of these books that uh, there's a very real possibility that they could go extinct. And so I was trying to figure out how do we stretch the library budgets get these books published and go open access at the same time. So how about that for squaring a circle? 
And why? Because the mandates are coming. Those people who are in academic publishing know an awful lot about this. Those outside, probably not. But the mantra is that uh, research coming out of government-funded public uh, research must be made publicly available, free to the end user. But everybody recognizes that publishing has a cost, so it's how does one pay for it. Uh, in the journal world, that's been sorted by what's called APCs, article processing charges. And these, um, this is money carved out of various big research budgets or university budgets to pay for the publishing of journal articles. But um, books are different, and they're different for a lot of reasons. And at least in the humanities and social sciences, at, studies have shown that about 65% of the output of academics is, is in book form, the long form publication. So, Knowledge Unlatched, what is it? It's basically uh, trying to set up a library consortium, a global library consortium that pays publishers the upfront investment costs of a book. So everything up to the first digital file, including the overheads associated with that. And the key to what I think will be the success of Knowledge Unlatched, and certainly the success of its pilot project, is that we're crowdsourcing from a very specific crowd. And that's the really big point I want to make. We're not just a Kickstarter, which everybody looks at to see if there's something that appeals to them. We're very specific to university research libraries and very specific for monographs. So the pilot, just a minute to, because uh, we've just completed this and we're very excited about it, uh, we tried to get 200 libraries from around the world uh, to sign up to unlatch 28 books. And the average contribution to the cost of the publisher was $12,000. The average cover price of these books, and it's not cheap, they're $95. And we had 13 publishers participate. Uh, we set out to get 200 libraries. We got nearly 300, 297 to be precise. And the average cost per library to unlatch this fixed fee of $12,000 turned out to be only $43. Now, we've got lots of information in our forthcoming report about things like the free rider issue, incentivizing libraries, assurance contracts connect for libraries connecting rather than collecting. But I'm going to finish my little slot um, with what was our one-minute pitch to libraries as to why they should get involved. And I hope the model is then clear from that. So there's a lovely man behind the screen. <laughs> And lovely man, could you please start uh, my video? <laughs> Librarians from all over the world are sharing the costs of making scholarly books open access through Knowledge Unlatched. We are helping librarians join together to offer publishers a title fee. In return for the title fee, which is a fixed amount, publishers make scholarly books available to anyone, anywhere in the world, to read or download for free on a Creative Commons license. As more libraries join Knowledge Unlatched, and because the title fee is a fixed amount, the cost of making each book open access becomes less for each library. The world needs librarians like you to ensure that good books are available for everyone to read. Be the change. Help secure an open future for books <coughs> by joining Knowledge Unlatched. Thank you, Francis. 59 seconds, was it? This is perfect. <laughs> well, <laughs> Jan? Yeah, great, thanks. So my name is Jan Reichelt. I'm one of the founders of Mendeley. Um, Mendeley got started uh, during our PhD stu studies. It has been kind of a uh, poster child, I think, in the academic space, uh, the, the science space, uh, as an internet startup. We founded uh, Mendeley in, in London to help us organize and collaborate on research papers that publishers like Elsevier Springer, so the academic publishers 
scholarly publishers would uh, publish and then make accessible through databases like ScienceDirect and so forth. As a student, then you would have PhD student, you would have like hundreds of PDF documents that you need to organize. <clears throat> and so we developed a software that would help you to organize these PDF documents very similar to iTunes helping you to organize MP3 files. And we then built in as a second step a collaboration function where you could create groups uh, and comment and share on documents in, in a private fashion as well as in a public fashion. And then the last step, the third step, which kind of was the kicker to the system, uh, was that we aggregated all the usage activity that individual end users and groups of users would do in their individual, uh, and individual libraries and groups on an aggregated level. So we would aggregate the data and would then be able to say, well, let's look into uh, how people are interacting with academic content around the world. So you can then basically say, let's compare Stanford with MIT and Imperial College and let's look at what these different people are kind of looking at, what they're reading uh, and so forth. We wouldn't do it on a personal basis, but you, know, you can aggregate it and, and look at the aggregated uh, view. We then made this data available through an API to third-party developers, and at the time now, we have about 300 third-party applications across the board who reuse that data and create even more value based on that information. So I think I'm here in order to speak for, let's say, uh, uh, the technology companies who try to find creative technology-based solutions to enable uh, users as well as publishers and institutions, basically everybody who is a stakeholder in that industry to do more with the content that is already out there. So very much in that fashion, we try to unlock that information. We try to unlatch, uh, so to say, uh, the academic paper and make it more accessible and, and we grow the pie because people start to monetize on that. And I'm, I guess I'm going to talk about that in a second. Fantastic. All right. Thanks, Jan. And Dan? Um, yeah, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Unbound, which is a company formed by three authors. Um, to try and find a new way of connecting with readers. And I was fascinated by Bill's talk earlier. And I think um, where we started was the only two things that really matter in publishing are authors and readers. And we think that if you can occupy the space in between them by offering a better value to both, um, then you're, you've, got a, you've got a good chance of finding a way through the current uncertainty. Um, and I think the thing that we've found, which is interesting, I think, for this session, is you've got to think really hard about what you're actually selling. Um, and when you start to think about it in a different way and think about what you're selling in a different way, you start to create different things. And I think one of the things I find most interesting about publishing is the idea that people approach it from a consumer mindset. So it's about getting things quick, easy and cheap. And that was very much the Amazon model. We're, we're not interested in that in the same way. We're trying to find ways of making people less mindless consumers and more involved. So what we do is we try and give a more direct relationship between the author and the reader. And that happens in many different ways. You can come to different events. You can monetize the relationship in different ways. But it used to be enough. Uh, if, if you'll forgive me, I'm going to plug one of our la latest books called The Wake, which Philip Pullman is reading and has described as extraordinary. Um, but what it, where it used to be enough in the, in the past to sort of show off your books on the bookshelf, what Unbound's done is say, yes, you can, pick up, you can show your your taste and your discerning ability to spot great books by displaying them on your bookshelf. But with Unbound, you can actually take the book off the shelf. You can open it and you can point to your name in the back because without you, literally, this book wouldn't exist. And what we've discovered is that by offering people a more direct relationship, they're prepared to pay a lot more. So our average pledge is £35, which I think is quite a positive difference from the average price paid in the bookshop, which I believe is around £5. So for us, it's about working out what the real value is. Um, and, but I think in order to exploit that, um, you have to have a, a clear, direct relationship with your audience. And I think that's probably the one area where publishers have, have uh, been let down. Fantastic. Thank you. And I'm going to pick up on your point there about value, because I think that's actually really, really key to this whole question about you know, when, when content is distributed. Where is the value and who is benefiting from that? So that's my opening question to you as a panel. Maybe if I, if I start with you, Dan. Who is benefiting from the distribution of content? But be also beyond that, thinking beyond content per se, you know, what else goes with that and who benefits from the communities, the metrics, you know, all, all the stuff that goes with it? I think the important thing is that authors benefit and that readers benefit. I mean, we've, as I say, we're, we started Unbound because we're writers and we want to earn more money. I mean. Um, Anthony's speech was fantastic and talked about the endangered species and authors are becoming an endangered species. It's becoming very hard to earn a living. <coughs> so our deal is a 50-50 profit share with the author. 
So all the costs come out of the crowdfunding, and then on top of that, any profits are shared with the author. But I think working out what you're selling is really important, because people, in our experience, don't just want to be told what to buy. They want to feel like they have a stake in it. They want to feel they're involved in it. And they literally put their money where their mouth is. And we had an interesting thing that happened over Christmas where one of our books didn't get to the person they were supposed to get to. And I rang her up. I put my mobile phone number out on Twitter to say if anybody had any issues in the run-up to Christmas to call me. And I had not very many calls, but I had a couple of calls. Um, and, and that was a really interesting process because after a refund, and she got very angry with me. She said, how dare you? I don't want my money back. I put in everything I could afford to make that book happen because I believe in it. No, I don't want a refund. And that told me something very interesting, that we're not selling what you think you're selling. So when it's just a book, which is part of an inventory with the long tail and Amazon have everything, yes, that's selling something. Um, but we're selling something very different. And we're only beginning, really, to understand what that is. And that's an incredibly exciting space, because when you give authors and readers the chance to talk directly, they start to decide between them what should be created. Um, and that happened with Jonathan Mead, who his first project took a year to fund, his second took a matter of weeks. And because he was able to talk to his fans and say, what do you think of this? They loved it. And so that's incredibly exhilarating. And I think that is what publishing is about. It's about being able to express and create these new things. And the problem with the current system is that there's so much bureaucracy between the author and great publishers and their readers that those two things aren't innovating in the way they could if they had a direct relationship. So we're attempting to do that. And we're discovering value in all kinds of areas. We sold a frontispiece dedication for one of our books for £5,000 to a kind of dot-com dot exile in New Zealand who was really interested in Bitcoin. And it's that kind of thing which you, um, you need to open your eyes to that by experiencing you know, new ways of connecting with the audience. Thank you. Yeah, and what's the value in, in Mendeley? What's, what, are you, what's, what are people getting apart from content? Um, yeah, so what I would say, is, I mean, a very high level comparison is that, that uh, might not be 100% correct, but shows you the, the way I think how, how we at Mendeley would think. So one thing is, in the, if you look in the music industry, what the music industry tried to sell was CDs, yeah. but what the people wanted was music. <clears throat> so uh, I, as I would agree with, it's not always you not as maybe as the owner of the content maybe don't necessarily always know what the value is to the consumer of that content. In Mendeley's case, uh, you know, you might say examples that we have based on the API, there was a, a developer who built a synchronization with a Kindle device, right? So you could synchronize your academic papers that you store in Mendeley to a, kin uh, to, a, to a Kindle. We wouldn't do that because the use case would be too small for us, but they actually then run a subscription model based on that with $5 per month, right? So the developer of that application charged users of that application $5 per month. <clears throat> we then would say, okay, you know, depending on, on the amount of users, we would say, okay, we want a cut of that because we provide the basis. But, you know, basically if you give that data to more people, our philosophy would be let the, figure, let the users and the consumers of the content figure out where they see the, the value. Another example is um, if you look at Spotify, how Spotify monetizes music. What they monetize is not necessarily the song itself, but they monetize convenience, right? Because you have the music in a personalized way, always on, streaming on all different devices. So it's not only about the music, but they tie it together with technology. And so this is another piece where I think is, you know, if you bundle technology, uh, uh, if you su have technology support the distribution of content, then you have different ways of extracting, uh, extracting more value than before in our world as just selling an individual uh, academic paper to end users. Interesting. Thank you. And then Francis, I mean, it's very interesting in your video, it's very clear that there's, um, there's an idealistic, altruistic uh, mission in there as well. What do you think about the value of the Knowledge Unlatched program? Uh, well, if it was only idealistic, it wouldn't succeed. Mm. So it has to offer something else. Uh, the value uh, of the books that go through Knowledge Unlatched, generally they're thought to be peer-to-peer -peer books, uh, but how do we really know that? How do we know that there isn't a market beyond the narrow academic market of any particular book? We don't, and I think every publisher of the old school who remembers the days of when everything was closed down in print, would say, we only skim the market, we don't penetrate the market, because the economics of these books never made sense. So forget the good old days. Uh, so one of the things that is, is possible is to measure access usage. Uh, 
of this open content. And there are some amazing surprises when content goes open. That's good for the academic, the metrics, measuring the value of the, of the work itself. But more, much more interestingly, um, not much more, but also interestingly, going beyond that, are the kinds of digital affordances that Bill was talking about. Some of this material is incredibly exciting in terms of the cutting edge things that you can do with it. So that is all facilitated once you have an open access model, a sustainable open access model, where um, the publishing process is paid for. And I should have added in the introduction that of course with these books, publishers are selling, continue to sell, and are surprised with the sales, good sales, of the print and other digital formats. Thank you. And Ashley. Yeah, well, I think that there's kind of a few different uh, groups that are receiving value from Wattpad. I think that for readers, they're benefiting from having, you know, the, the breadth of content that's available without a gatekeeper in between. I think that we're seeing some really interesting genres really flourish on Wattpad and really over-index compared to the traditional publishing industry where there isn't someone in the middle deciding what people will read. People are choosing what to read. Um, an example that I've been really interested in lately is the flourishing community of uh, teen Muslim romances on Wattpad that are just doing so well and have this huge audience and it's something that I'm not seeing in the traditional publishing industry. And I think that for writers, it's you know, great to have uh, a, a community of you know, millions of readers that have downloaded the app and opted in, like identifying themselves as readers, to be able to present new content too, to receive that feedback in that community. And you know, like Dan was saying, that direct relationship and establishing that in different ways is extremely important for most writers. And I think for publishers, we've primarily been working in two different ways. And I think the first way, being a community of millions of readers each month, publishers are starting to bring their writers to Wattpad to connect with our audience and to establish that, that relationship that's what make, makes Wattpad so successful as a way of making our audience aware of other books that are coming out, finding ways to you know, advertise and appeal to our audience. And then on the other side, they're looking at Wattpad as an acquisition tool and looking at writers that are starting to write on Wattpad, encouraging some people that are interested in getting their works published to instead put it on Wattpad first while they can you know, evaluate how it's doing. And I think that the data offers in, in, you know, so much value to publishers. When you look at unsolicited manuscript, how much data do most publishers receive on that? And you know, most publishers can't even begin to even you know, attempt to read half the things that come in in these, you know, uh, I remember when I worked at a publisher, there was just a box for interns that you could just read something and if it happened to get published, you'd get you know, a tiny bonus. And I never saw anything even read, never mind acquired uh, from that. And I think that's a great way to, uh, you know, to begin to to you know, move a lot of that stuff to sites like Wattpad, there's a great value in the data you can get. Not only can you find out what's most popular and what's appealing to certain demographics, but even stats, you know, the amount of information that we can receive, like which stories have the longest session times that people can't put down. That's you know, a very interesting stat when you're looking at something and whether or not you would uh, you know, think that that's something that the audience wants or uh, the completion rates of stories. That's all really inf interesting data that publishers have never had when making a decision of whether to publish something or not. So it's very interesting, isn't it? It's a very wide range of stakeholders benefiting, very much not just the, the person who's reading the content. Oh, absolutely. And, and also this sense of openness and uncertainty and, and evolving models and evolving value That's from, from all of you, which is interesting. Um, and I'm particularly interested in, in your point about the, the genres kind of evolving and, and, and coming, and you do that, I didn't know that was a thing, it's a thing now. <laughs> um, and I, th I think one of the things that's interesting about you as a panel is, is that you represent um, scholarly um, and, and broad trade. And one of the questions that I wanted to ask you, maybe I'll come to scholarly first, um, Jan, if I would look at you first, um, what do you think the difference is? Is it easier, harder, better? What, what are the specific issues around working with a, a more niche targeted market than working with a very, very broad trade platform? So, Jan, if I can start with you. Well, it's hard to tell because I, I would say I don't have too much experience in the, let's say, uh, uh, traditional publishing, uh, or let's say, consumer publishing industry. Uh, I think in particular for the scholarly publishing industry, it's incredibly slow moving. Um, I would say that's, that's a challenge. Uh, and I think a challenge is as well that in that particular industry, and I think that's actually a little bit different maybe from the uh, other publishing industries, is that publishers traditionally um, have sold, so the business models are based on selling to institutions. 
So there is no straightforward, let's say, relationship between the publisher and the actual consumer of the content because the, the, let's say, the customer, so the person who pays, is actually a very different one. And that makes it very hard for a publisher to really think about, uh, about the, the end user itself and to look at, okay, how can we increase the value for the end user because the money comes from a different, a different person. Now, I have to say, uh, Mendeley got acquired by Elsevier, one of the biggest uh, academic publishers last year, and so we are now having internally very interesting conversations around exactly that topic because we actually have now proof and data that we can put forward internally and can say, look, for example, if we show two-page PDF previews on article pages to the end users who use the Mendeley product or who go on mendeley.com to explore academic content, and if you put up two-page PDF previews, before it was just the abstract, two-page PDF previews of the Elsevier content, then we can demonstrate via data that actually that increases the engagement with the content and increases usage of the content. So, meaning, in short, if we give more information to people, they will engage more with the content. I mean, what a surprise. <laughs> but uh, the good thing is, because, you know, in that case, the company uh, uh, Elsevier is obviously a very big company with very different stakeholders and very different interests, you know, as long as you don't have the proof, it's very hard from the outside to make someone really believe in your mission. Now, the good thing is internally we have these uh, conversations and now we have for all Elsevier papers, we have two page PDF previews, which is something that iTunes with uh, the 30 second, and I think by now it's actually one minute, uh, listening previews on music have, have demonstrated. So in that sense, we are not doing anything new, we're just adapting something that we've seen work in other industries to our industries. Just because, let's say, the scholarly publishing industry is maybe a little bit slower. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Francis. Anything to add to that? Um, just briefly, uh, I've never worked in trade publishing, so it's a bit of a mystery to me. Uh, but the conservatism that I see in the academic world, it, it depends on the discipline, but certainly in the humanities and social sciences, it, it's often actually coming from um, a particular generation of academics uh, who are in conflict with some of the other generation of, of academics. Uh, but there is a, a confluence of uh, uh, policy makers, uh, funders who are all pushing to find routes to open access. Knowledge Unlatched is one, but there are others that are coming along as well. And I think What's interesting to me to hear about some of the trade initiatives is that y you galvanize the people who are comfortable with the technology and who are happy to experiment. And what I've found is that it's not always that easy to convince people to experiment. Once the experiment is over and you've been successful, if you've been successful, it's a whole lot easier. But that hurdle, it's a lot harder to get over that. Mm. It's interesting, isn't it? Once you have a success, once you can demonstrate something, once you have evidence, but it's getting that initial yeah. step. Interesting. And mm -hmm. Ashley? Yeah, I don't think that we necessarily went out with a focus on trade. I think that Wattpad was always envisioned as a really broad platform that could really be a home to any type of content. I think that what really is driving growth in certain areas and, and driving kind of new genres emerging and expansion of, of what our focus is, is really the community itself, which isn't necessarily one thing when you have not one community, over, yeah, exactly. With over, you know, 20 million users, we're seeing lots of uh, New, new ones emerge, new demographics begin to, to cluster around different types of content, which begins to attract more of that type. Um, so it's something that continues to evolve that is not, again, just one thing. And even things that we've been traditionally strong in that continue to grow, like teen fiction and romance, um, we're starting to see lots of nonfiction emerge. And we're starting to see um, more science fiction as something that's been growing in, in kind of recent months. So it's something that just, it's not something that as a platform we focus on, but it's things that begin to emerge through our community. And Dan, same question for you. Are there other areas that, that do seem to support the, the, the new models that you're creating, creating better than others? Well, we always start with um, basically where the idea came from, which was, um, I mean, my experience of trade publishing was as a writer. And I had 10, ten years where I was earning, you know, got reasonable advances. So I did one book which sold loads, which allowed me to do other books. And they were reasonably respectable sales. But I guess I was a classic Middle East author. Um, and then after the crash, advances disappeared and I stopped being offered advances. And I remember I was working for minimum wage, clearing out the rat-infested basement of an accountant in Bognor Regis, which I'd slagged off in crap towns ten years earlier. 
in a moment of hubris. It doesn't get and much worse than that, does it? It doesn't get much worse than that. And I remember sitting on the beach thinking, I've spent 10 years building an audience and I've got no idea who any of them are. You know, I've, had to, I've been going through these gatekeepers to get to them. I can't talk to them. I have no concept of who they are, what they are. I wouldn't be able to talk to them. And that's essentially what Unbound is, really. It's a way for an author to capture that audience. So what we do is, um, in answer to your question, the books that get funded are the ones where the author's the most engaged, where the author understands that this is their lifelong career. If they want to have a sustainable income as a writer, they need to know who buys their books. So what we've built is like, it's like an author dashboard where when you, you can go in and see where your pledges are coming from in real time. So in some books, 30% is Facebook. In others, it's nothing. Twitter's a lot lower than you'd expect. But all because of the referrals, the, the, what the author can do is they're empowered with that information. And so they can basically go on and say, OK, well, Facebook's working at that time of day. I'm going to do more of that then. But what is interesting is that it's completely different for every individual author. So there's no blanket approach that works. It's entirely dependent on the individual writer, what they're comfortable with, what they're happy to do, what networks they're engaged in, because networks existed before the internet. We have a phishing writer who doesn't have a mobile phone, let alone Twitter or Facebook, and he raised 20 grand in a month. So it's, a, it's about the author becoming aware and prepared to engage with their audience, and the ones that are prepared to do that flourish. Um, and they're, you know, they're asking us to do things which have nothing to do with books, because we've got their audience, and we're building their audience. Um, but the trade, is, it's, it's always been a challenge. But I think what we found fascinating is that the books which are really successful, like Letters of a Note was a book which we sold 4,000 copies of in advance. We raised over 100 grand in pledges before it had even gone to press. And that was number five on the Sunday Times bestseller list. So it's a great way for breaking new talent too. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the important thing for us is making sure the author gets the long game which is, it's about them having a sustainable livelihood. <coughs> Brilliant, thank you. So crowd, crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, you know, clear model there. Working with the libraries to unlatch, very, very clear model. Ashley, <laughs> tell me a little bit more about the long-term business model behind Wattpad. Sure, so, you know, um, we've also done some experiments with crowdsourcing. I think in general... This uh, is your fun... Fan, fan funding. Fan funding, yeah. exactly. So, you know, I really loved the presentation on YouTube this morning, and one of the things they talked about was the different stages of, of their company and of their growth. And I think like other user-generated content sites, we're, you know, primarily focused on growth right now, which is going very well. Um, and, you know, the more users you have, the more opportunities you have to make money because you only need to monetize a smaller percentage of those. So we're continuing to experiment and test out what's resonating with our community. All of those fan-funded projects were all, you know, funded to completion and beyond. They all did very well. And we're continuing to, to learn from how those projects did as they are now releasing in the market. Uh, two of those titles were just published by Sourcebooks and they were released on March 1st. So we're starting to get that sales data in now and it's really exciting to see how they're doing in the industry. It's not the only thing we've tried. You know, we do have uh, you know, some uh, banner advertisements throughout the site. It's something that isn't too obtrusive to the reading experience, but when you have that many site visits each month, it generate significant revenue. Uh, we've also experimented with a few other different types of content. You know, branded content is something that we've done in the past with uh, people like One Direction that are, you know, uh, commissioning writers to write official fan fictions for them to seed that into the community. That's not the only one we've done. We've had, you know, lots of people in the entertainment space that are looking to reach, you know, our attractive young demographics by putting content in front of them that will appeal to them. So we do have people that are hiring and commissioning writers, both native writers on Wattpad and other famous writers to write content on Wattpad. And then we've also seen, uh, done some experiments in licensing. So looking to writers, we're getting a lot of this early data on what's resonating and starting to look to them, to how can we you know, partner with them, find them the right opportunities, both in film and, and you know, uh, traditional books, and how can we uh, work with them to to create these opportunities. It's a very interesting blurring between that traditional content and, and the traditional marketing, just uh, the, the brand building and, and coming together with the content there. Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. And we'll continue to do more experiments this year as our you know, user demographics change. It, we're learning so much more about what our users want and what they'll pay for. And if you had to place your bet, would you say that there will be a single clear business model for you? Or will you see it will be, it'll be a layering of all these different ways of getting in money? I think it'll always be layering. I think that there, it's a really broad platform and there are so many 
many different verticals that we can tap into. I think that different people in the company will be focused on different parts of that. Um, and you know, something that, sorry, I didn't mention before is also data licensing. The amount of data that we know about our users, the amount of that that we can feed back to, to the publishing industry, to the entertainment industry. We have a feature on our site called casting, where uh, users can cast celebrities in their fictional stories. And that's extremely interesting to people that are actually casting movies. You know, who are the teens casting in their books right now? Mm -hmm. um, who do they want to see as leading men, as you know, the, the protagonists? And that's you know, being very interesting to agents and to, to other people in that space. Fantastic. Yeah, I was going to go straight. The, the, the data thing brought me straight back to you, Jan. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I would like to add a comment to, in, in particular, obviously, the question like who pays and how, you know, what's the commercial piece of all that? And, and again, putting myself here in front uh, as kind of the, one of the startup guys. Um, I, I think if you look at statistics, how long it takes startup companies to actually get to some meaningful amount of revenue. So there's actually uh, analysis has been done on that, and it's one IPO dash, uh, dashboards, I think. And you can see that on average, it takes a company, a startup company, between seven, eight, nine years to get to something like 50 million in revenue. So I think to ask what is your business model, to ask that a startup, and let's say in the first three years, is, is you're probably not going to result in, in a meaningful discussion. I think as a startup guy, you would probably think about that, and yes, you present your ideas to investors, and they might believe it or not. But um, if you're realistic, you, you simply don't know. And so what I think is, from a, from a publisher's perspective, the way to solve this problem, or the way I think how some companies have uh, you know, impressively solved that, uh, you, you have different ways. One is either you do it, for example, like, like Elsevier, who say, okay, we believe in the model, we see a huge uh, user engagement, and you know, we see just the value uh, in, the, in the product, in the end user product. So we maintain Mendeley as a kind of playground to run experiments to discover where the value is. So we have a couple of, paying th uh, a couple of thousand paying end users who just pay us between $5 and $15 per month for more storage, uh, just simply more convenience. Then we have the collaboration piece where we have suddenly the US Army, a special effects studio, uh, any sort of academic uh, people who need to interact with papers. So outside of the focus of a traditional publisher, I would say, scholarly publisher, who then use the platform uh, in a collaborative fashion. And then you have the whole data piece where th suddenly you explore, like, I mean, we would never have thought about a Kindle sync. We would never have thought about all the stuff that people can do with data, where you can, you know, have recommendations from Mendeley compared to your, like, 23andMe DNA analysis, and people are willing to pay for that, right? So you suddenly discover something new. Run a vehicle that allows you to run those experiments. Uh, another example is, I think, Macmillan does this quite successfully. They have a, a small group, of, uh, actually it has grown quite significantly, called Digital Science, where they strategically invest in smaller early stage companies with the main aim, well, we want to get our ear on the ground, we want to have and talk to the right people, we want to acquire potentially talent, and well, we'll figure out the revenue later and we have a budget for that. Another way is quite impressive in my view is how Axel Springer, as a, as a publisher, did it in Germany. They also have a portfolio of smaller companies who I think by now contribute like 30 or 40 percent of their overall revenue uh, th that, they made, uh, that they make as a publisher. So uh, I think because otherwise, you know, you're stuck in, in, okay, you have the existing business model, you have your sales force, and to get out of that, you need to, it's very difficult to innovate all that in-house, I believe. Yeah. Um, so just Especially as... Especially when publishing houses, like, because in order to get market share, they just, but they just acquire each other. Yeah. So they get bigger and bigger and more and more unwieldy, which historically would suggest they're even less likely to innovate. Yeah. But I think that's, that's dead right. You get, you get, you know, you're like the R&D department. That's a really interesting way of looking at it. So lots of diversification, experimentation, looking outside the industry. Brilliant. We've got about five minutes left. I'm just going to throw it over to the floor. I've got about eight more questions that I could cheerfully ask here, but I don't want to be selfish. Is there anybody who'd like to ask the panel a question about different models for revenues, where publishers fit into this? Go ahead. It depends whether we have those. Can I, just, can I just repeat the question because I'm not sure that everybody would have heard it. Sorry, the question was about rights and what happens when, uh, for example, a book gets picked up by a major um, film studio house. What happens then to the, the value of the intellectual property? Sorry, Dan. Uh, it's just the same as normal in that if you have the rights, we would sell them in the same way as any other publisher. Um, I mean, with letters of note, that's been sold to 12 different countries now. 
And we, we actually joint ventured the trade edition of that with Canongate, and they do right, so they were keen not to replicate the traditional overhead where possible, um, because most of our money gets spent on technology. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a traditional model. I mean, there's, it, you know, in the future, I, like, I, I can see Unbound operating in every country, and you wouldn't sell the rights because you crowdfund the German language rights in the German version of Unbound, and you, know, you, you can begin to see rights themselves becoming a questionable uh, idea. Um, but again, it's all done. That depends on the individual contract with each individual author. We have most world rights for everything, to be honest. Thank um, you. Does that answer the question? Any other questions? There are microphones around the place, so I don't have to repeat everything. No? Right, in that case, I'm going to carry on. <laughs> so, um, one of my questions, well, I guess I'll wrap up with this one because we've got to finish in a couple of minutes anyway. But in this democratisation of content movement, is there really a place for publishers? And if so, what is it? I'm just going to take in, in turn. <laughs> <laughs> sure, absolutely. You know, I think that uh, one of the things that I mentioned already was all of the ways that publishers can work with Wattpad, both in you know, bringing a lot of their writers to the site and in finding writers that are finding this you know, success on Wattpad and bringing them into the traditional book industry. I think that something that we heard about this morning and that continues to be true is that people are still buying physical books. They're still buying books in a bookstore. A lot of those skills of distribution, um, managing retail relationships, those are all things that you know, publishers are very good at all of those skills, and that's something that I know Wattpad personally, we're not looking into getting into the physical supply chain, and we'll continue to look for partners and ways to do that. Okay, thank you. Francis? Well, in academic publishing, shortly put, it's, it's the branding and the quality control that's important. But I think the, uh, Michael Blackshirt did, said this really well in his book, The Content Machine, when he said publishing is about filtering, framing, and amplifying. And that seems to continue to be the role. Thank you. Jan? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I don't have much to add. It's, it's the, for, in academic publishing, it's clearly the filtering, it's the brand, right? Especially, funnily enough, in the academic industry, it's for the younger career yeah. researchers who need that stamp of approval, who you, who you would think could be a bit more uh, innovative, right? But they do, in order to advance in their career, need the paper published in The Lancet or in Nature. While it's the uh, sometimes older and more tenured professors who can run more experiments because they already have kind of their secured position, if you like. So, um, but I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, right? I mean, to maintain quality in academic publishing is, is crucial, I think. Uh, and I do think that uh, publishers can, can uh, well, that's, that's the business of the publisher to add their expertise in the filtering and the quality. Thank you. And Dan, finally. I'd agree with all that. I mean, we're a publisher too. I mean, I don't see us as being different from another publisher. We do all the same things normal publishers do, add value in ways which um, are important to writers. Every book I've ever written has been made a lot better by someone telling me that's rubbish, redo it. And, you know, you don't get that in self-publishing. Not everyone wants to do it on their own. They don't want to become a distributor, a typesetter, a cover designer. They don't want to have a thousand copies of their books on their kitchen table and post them out themselves. I mean, there will always be that role. Um, the question is, for me, is in entirely whether publishers you know, have the courage to strike out and find new ways of connecting with their audiences. Um, but I'd, on an uplifting note, I did a talk at an MMA, um, MMA publishing course at UCL last week, and I'd have hired every single student in that room. <laughs> they're terrified of the industry they're coming into, but they had so much energy and so many ideas, and they think with the technology. They don't have to catch up. They're already doing it. And I am, I am going to hire as many of them as I can because I'm going to make them entrepreneurs and I'm going to say to them, you want to be a publisher, be a publisher. Come and crowdfund your books on Unbound. You be the editor. You find the books which you think are going to be successful and then you can do all the editorial work. And they can set themselves up in business. I think there's a need for a more entrepreneurial spirit to, a, to emerge. And that's inevitable if you have authors and readers in your mind as the things you're serving. You can't help but be entrepreneurial because it's such an exciting business to be in. Fantastic. Thank you. So basically, do what we do really, really well. Do new stuff. Experiment, build, analyse, partner, be entrepreneurs. Got that? <laughs> Thank you very much, my panel. Thank you. <laughs>